Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good afternoon. Uh, we're just uh, opening the webinar now, and we'll give a few minutes for people to join. Uh, welcome. Uh, I will explain the interpretation once we get started, but please feel free to put in the chat where you are joining us from, and thank you for coming. Uh, vamos a comenzar en algunos minutos. Personas están uniendo con nosotros en este momento porque el webinar está abierto. Y si quieres poner algunos mensajes en el chat, está abierto y vamos a comenzar pronto. Gracias. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 17th monthly US-Canada Hands-Off Venezuela Picket Action. Buenas tardes a todos y todas. Bienvenidos y bienvenidas a nuestra acción eh, mensual para los Estados Unidos y Canadá fuera de Venezuela y Free Alex Saab and to Free Alex Saab. Antes de comenzamos, Voy a explicar el sistema de interpretación porque este webinar está disponible en inglés y español. Uh, en algunos minutos vamos a empezar el sistema de interpretación y en uh, su computadora o teléfono hay una parte abajo que dice es, um, más y en esta parte es posible uh, entrar el sistema de interpretación y hay una opción adentro de esto. Um, a, a seleccionar su idioma, inglés o español, y hay una opción también, se dice uh, silenciar el audio original, y este es muy bien a usar. Vamos a poner las instrucciones en el chat también. Thank you everyone for joining. This is a, a great afternoon to be here together, united for an end to US-Canada sanctions on Venezuela and to free Alex Saab. We have uh, interpretation available. So in just one second, we'll turn on the system for interpretation. You go to the bottom of your screen, computer or telephone, and there will be an option for more and then an option to enter the interpretation or a globe symbol. Then you choose your language, English or Spanish, and then you um, also hit the option that says to silence original audio. We'll put the instructions in the chat as well. And uh, thank you in advance to Julieta and Anna, who are interpreters, interpreters for tonight's event. So we'll just go ahead and get that started. Excellent. So thank you again, everyone. Uh, my name is Alison Bodine. I am the coordinator of the Fire This Time movement for social justice, Venezuela Solidarity Campaign. And we are one of the organizers of this, the 17th uh, men monthly picket for US Canada Hands Off Venezuela and End to Sanctions on Venezuela and uh, to demand the freedom of Venezuelan diplomat Alex Saab currently held in US jails. Today's actions are organized uh, by the Venezuela Peace Committee in Winnipeg, the Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice, Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, and Just Peace Advocates with the support of Venezuela Solidarity organizations and individuals across Canada. 
I also want to acknowledge that this event is being broadcast and I am here on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish nations, the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh and the Musqueam nations. And I encourage people who are participating to put in the chat uh, where they are joining us from and uh, the indigenous stolen territories that they are uh, working from if they know them or to look them up if they do not. And also to uh, take a moment to reflect on the importance of our continued work as we work against uh, US Canada sanctions, US imperialist intervention in Latin America. We also recognize uh, imperialism here in Canada and the United States and call for self-determination for Indigenous nations. We have a really excellent lineup of panel uh, today, an international panel uh, featuring uh, Ven Vanessa Ortiz, a Venezuelan journalist and member of the Free Alex Saab movement, speaking direct from Venezuela. David Paul, a leading member of the Venezuelan Embassy Protection Collective who defended the embassy of Venezuela in the United States against right-wing takeover in 2019. Ken Stone, a longtime anti-war, labor, anti-racism and environmental activist from the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War and Jose Luis Granado Ceja, who is a journalist based in Mexico City and a staff writer with Venezuela Analysis and a host of their podcast, which uh, we will share more about today, as well as we are joined once again and honored to be joined once again by Professor Luis Acuna, the Charge d'Affaires of the Venezuelan Embassy in Canada, who continues to do his work, uh, although he's not able um, to be in Canada at this time. We, of course, are meeting at a very uh, critical time, a very interesting time, which we'll reflect more about today. The U.S. campaign of sanctions and uh, attempting to pressure the people of Venezuela, starve the people of Venezuela into overthrowing their democratically elected government is coming against uh, the simple fact that the U.S. Uh, needs to keep up their supply and world supply of oil. So we've actually seen some lifting, very minute, very small, of the U.S. sanctions regime against Venezuela. We've also seen an, a continued movement of people of Latin America against uh, US intervention and imperialism uh, with recent elections, including the election in Colombia. So all of these factors together, of course, mean that these actions and our work united together to push more and more to end the criminal sanctions of the United States and Canada's complicity in the sanctions are more and more important. Uh, at the end of June 2022, the U.S. sent a second high-level delegation for bilateral talks with the democratically elected government of President Maduro in Venezuela. But despite this, the U.S. government and the government of Canada, as well as a small handful of other uh, allies of the United States, continue to recognize U.S. puppet Juan Guaido as Venezuela's interim president and to meet with representatives of the so-called interim government. And then, of course, we have the continued detention of Venezuelan diplomat Alex Saab, who is unjustly held in U.S. jails for his work to attempt to alleviate just a small amount of the pressure on the people of Venezuela. Um, and for this, he's being held and tortured in U.S. prison. So uh, we'll hear important updates about this case. Thank you again for everyone joining. And reminder that at the end, if you have a sign, a t-shirt, a button, or you have nothing at all but a, a fist of resistance, then we'll join together in a photo. To start us off today, uh, we're gonna see if Vanessa Ortiz is able to, to join. Um, I know her internet connection um, might not be as strong as we'd like it. So we're gonna test and have patience and uh, welcome Vanessa Ortiz, who is a young Venezuelan journalist and organizer with the Free Alex Saab movement and is joining us directly from Venezuela. Vanessa, can, are you able to uh, turn on your microphone? I think you are muted, Vanessa.
microphone is on mute and it might, you might be frozen now. Ahora sí me escucha. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Sí, ahora sí, ahora sí me escucha. Bien, quiero... Great. So I wanted to uh, say good evening to everyone who has joined us uh, today in Venezuela and also abroad. To me, it's a great honor to be here representing the Free Alexav movement, a movement to defend the diplomat, Venezuelan diplomat, also a movement that helps us uh, dismantle all that um, media manipulation that has been started by a group that is devoted to uh, damaging the image of our diplomats. Sometimes I wonder what will we do when Alex Saab is freed? How will they, they uh, justify all these lies they have said during these two years, lie after lie? The United States has no proof of the accusations. If the United States uh, doesn't have any proof, well, the media doesn't either. So what is the explanation they will give to justify this amount of lies? This is what I wonder. Also, I wanted to highlight something on the case of Alex Saab. Here in Venezuela, we are waiting on the results of this case on the recognition and the acknowledgement of his uh, immunity, diplomatic immunity. The case is frozen. The United States government is meditating to say whether Alex Saab is a diplomat or not. Something that to our president uh, it has been duly accredited. That is, we had to ask for permission from the White House to uh, give uh, accreditation for a diplomat. Right now, the United States has 32 special uh, missions around the world. And I wonder, Alex Ab doesn't have the same right. He was, he was taking that right away from him. However, those 32 special missions uh, from the United States around the world are protected by the Vienna Convention. That right was taken away from Alex Ab. And however, the United States attributes that right to, to themselves. So sometimes I feel that they have taken away the, the binding nature of the Vienna Convention. It's absurd to hear that the United States court is determining the status of uh, Alex Saab as a diplomat, even knowing that there's the recent former uh, def uh, defense secretary's um, declarations show that the United States knew that Alex Saab was a diplomat. So the persecution on Venezuela has been ongoing. It's a people that has resisted many wars, psychological wars, economic wars. And now we see a, a war against diplomacy. I continue saying that the United States has kidnapped the world's democracy and diplomacy. So far, the Venezuelan government has made so much effort. It has been very um, um, on top of this case. And we see the opposition. And behind the opposition, we see the White House. So far, we don't know when this dialogue will can, will happen between the, the United States government and us. The Venezuelan government will not agree to a talk until they guarantee that they, Alex Saab will be freed. So far, uh, they have presented two conditions. Uh, we have presented two conditions. First, to uh, have the sanctions be lifted. We have campaigned over this constantly. We're not requesting the United States to, to give us something for free. It's actually a right. We are demanded we are demanding that the United States give us back something that they took away from us. I am, I have faith in the fact that Alex Saab will come back to our country. Another condition that was brought by our president, Nicolas Maduro, was that 
the United States guarantee that Alex Saab, uh, given that he is a that he will be a, a member, a delegate at that dialogue. Last year, we were betting on an honest dialogue. We presented many proposals and Venezuelan delegation was there at the dialogue table and the United States and the opposition were stabbing that dialogue in the back. That is, while the government knew or, or thought, hoped that this meeting will come to to a good uh, result actually the, the fruit of uh, the result of that was a treason this is normally the the method the mechanism that they employ constantly both lies and treason i insist that alex Saab, so far he has proven his loyalty and his love for venezuela he ended up being more patriotic than the whole right wing that is rotted, that they say that they represent Venezuela. And however, they, even though they say that they want democracy, they leave the country whenever they want. They, they come back whenever they want to Venezuela. And they are actually quite contradictory. There's, their discourse is quite contradictory. So this is why so far we have not have we do not have a certain date for that dialogue. We will have that dialogue, but only when we are guaranteed that that dialogue is sincere and transparent, which is what we want the most. Also, I wanted to, to highlight some, some other points. The people of Venezuela recently both the Free Alex Ab movement led by Camila Fabri uh, we have to recognize Camila's work both at the foundation and also here in Venezuela. I, truly, um, the her charisma is is enormous. We have felt the love for her and Alex Saab. We uh, she feels as a Venezuelan as well, and that is very satisf satisfactory to us. So here at the movement we are campaigning to disseminate the truth and to defend Alex Ab. We also are in charge of going all over Venezuela to try to help the needy uh, all over the country. And recently, Camila, the, the campaign inaugurated different uh, food centers and Camila was there working because she wants to defend Venezuela. So we have to applaud those efforts. And each of us Venezuelans, we have to contribute to that cause. I encourage Venezuelans, those who are a bit doubtful and didn't know who an Alexa was, uh, I encourage them to contribute. This is something that the United States government does not forgive from Alex Saab, this, this uh, solidarity. Alex Saab really used uh, his tools to bypass an economic sanction. Recently, we sent Alex Saab some letters and through his lawyers, he received these letters and we transmitted this strength, this constant struggle that he has had, the, the infinite loyalty that he has shown. He received the, let the letters and he replied to them. So in a letter that a Venezuelan sent on that same page, on, on the other side of the letter, Alex Saab responded, replied. And that shows that he is really connected to us. Even though he's not present, he is connected to Venezuela. He acknowledges the Venezuelan government's effort to, to achieve his freedom. So we are hopeful that we will have Alex Saab this year in Venezuela. This is what I feel. So I want to encourage all of you who are uh, who have joined this meeting from all over the world to, to really join us because we want to, to fight together. Right now we're a victim of a constant attack. So we have to ask ourselves if Venezuela is suffering that situation right now, maybe tomorrow your country can suffer those things and we will be there to to fight 
alongside you because Venezuela will always be there. And something that I think about the United States government is that they used his kidnap as um, as a resource to, to have something to negotiate with Venezuela. They knew that they were going to need Venezuela. And this is what they have shown. We have received recently a delegation from the United States because they need our oil. And so the Venezuelan government can can have that resource to, to, to accept to go to the dialogue table. They wanted to have that too, and this is why they kidnapped Alex Hab also, because they constantly exert pressure on Venezuela. Something else that I would like to highlight on the movement Free Alex Hab, we recently uh, participated in the counter summit against the NATO summit, a summit where we supported peace, a summit to say no to the expansion of NATO. Venezuela bets for a multipolar world, a more just world, a world where we are all included, not a unipolar world, as the United States and the European Union would like to have. Different countries uh, of the world has helped us, have helped us in this efforts. Something else that I would like to highlight is that so far Venezuela has received the support from different countries, even in the, within the United States and in Canada as well, we have seen that support. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank the Cuban people because each day they are supporting us on the on the social media, also their government. This week we received Buena Fe, a music group, and they really were very solidary with, with us and with Camila. And we are seeing that constant struggle to free Alex Ab. So rest assured that Venezuela will be willing here to, to help. If we are the victims today, tomorrow the victims may be other any other country. So let's take the, this example. If you want to write a letter to Alex Ab from any other country in the world, he will receive that. We will send the letter his way and he will read it and he will reply. So once again, I wanted to say that here in Venezuela, we're still fighting. We are willing to continue with the struggle and with this movement that to me has been very satisfactory. When I decided to join this campaign, um, I didn't know what I would do, but right now I feel that I did not make any mistakes. This is the only tool that we have to, to defend ourselves in the face of the class of the United States and all in the face of this campaign that they wanted to use to create an image of an Alex Ab that is not existent. Because if the United States government has uh, dropped all charges except one charge for conspiracy that they do not even believe themselves, they have accused them of so many things and uh, just uh, overnight, they dropped all charge charges. So I wanted to thank each and every one of you and to say that we continue struggling. And I want to encourage you to join our movement. You can follow me and on the movement on the social media. You can also feel, uh, follow Camila. We insist we will not stop until we achieve uh, the freedom of Alex Hab. And before concluding, I wanted to show something that I did, and I did this with so much love because this is what the United States did with the Vienna Convention. This is what this sign reads. 762 days of kidnapping. This is what they have turned the Vienna Convention 
convention into, a kidnap that has lasted for more than 700 days. We demand the freedom of our diplomat. Alex has to come back to his country. He has to, go, to come back to his territory. He fought for this country at the most hard, at the hardest time when the world had turned its back to us. Only seven countries supported us at the moment, only seven countries. And I remember that uh, the Cuba, Cuba is, is a country, is a people that doesn't have many things, but they are very, uh, they are very, they have so much solidarity. Latin America has to wake up. Chavez was a, a president that united the whole continent. And when they, we needed them the most, they turned their backs on us. So Alex Saab has to come back to its country. The United States cannot kidnap democracy, cannot continue playing around with the Vienna Con Convention. And I want to conclude my intervention by thanking all of you and all of you who have been following the case very closely. Thank you very much, Vanessa Ortiz. Muchísimas gracias. Uh, we are so grateful you are able to join us from the Free Alex Saab movement in Venezuela. It is only possible for us to struggle uh, for Alex Saab's freedom because we can stand alongside the people of Venezuela and the Free Alex Saab movement uh, because you are working so hard. Uh, we. Uh, must do more from here to uh, unite together, uh, to uh, bring different forces and uh, people from progressive movements uh, to support Alex Saab, especially leading up uh, to the next trial that he'll be having, uh, which I believe is happening in August. Uh, though, of course, the US government, as you said, doesn't uh, really even fully believe their own charges and perhaps will delay once again. Alex Saab has been held for over 760 days illegally and uh, in a cruel manner by the United States. And it is important that people in the US know about this injustice, as well as people here in Canada. If you would like to write a letter to Alex Saab, as Vanessa said, you can write one by hand and then send me a photo of it. And I will be sure that it gets to Alex Saab. I will put my email in the chat especially if you're participating uh, from North America, we want to be able to send more letters. Thank you. Uh, yes, Nino, the next uh, scheduled date for Alex Saab is the 29th of August. I also want to say that each 16th of the month, which is the anniversary of when Alex Saab was kidnapped from Cape Verde and sent to uh, the United States, each 16th of the month, there is an online day of action Many people also hold demonstrations around the world, and I encourage people to get involved in that and to support and use the hashtag free Alex Saab, especially on the 16th of the month. So that's Saturday, uh, two days from now. Thank you again, Vanessa, and free Alex Saab. Our next speaker today is David Paul. David is here uh, joining us from San Francisco, so California in the United States. As I mentioned, he is a leading member of the Venezuelan Embassy Protection Collective who defended the Embassy of Venezuela in the United States against right-wing attack and takeover in 2019. David is a longtime supporter of solidarity with Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua, a member of the Sanctions Kill Coalition, the Task Force on the Americas, and the Democratic Socialists of America, which has recently organized a tour of Venezuelan uh, feminist women across the United States. So I am very much looking forward to uh, hearing a report on that tour and so much more, David. The floor is yours. <clears throat> All right, thank you. And a reminder to try and speak slowly, please, for our interpreters. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Well, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here, and uh, it's great work that you're doing to put this um, these events on every month. 
um, like she said, I was um, uh, had the pleasure and uh, honor of helping to host this tour of three Venezuelan feminist activists to the United States um, <clears throat> last month, uh, sponsored by the Democratic Socialists of America and Code Pink. Uh, they were on it, and I wanted to explain some things that happened on the tour about the um, the three women themselves and some other thoughts that came out of their um, their tour. Um, they toured seven cities in the United States, talking about the impact of sanctions, meeting local city officials, congressional officers, um, met with community organizations, uh, members of DSA chapters, did public events um, and radio interviews. And then at the end of the tour in Los Angeles, they participated and spoke at the Alternative People Summit in Los Angeles. Um, one, one of the participants was Monica Monsera, a professor of the National Arts University. She manages a group uh, preserving Afro-Venezuelan musical traditions. Angie Hernandez is an uh, indigenous woman from uh, the YU uh, community uh, bordering on Colombia. And she works in a social organization called Todas Nosotras Violeta. It uh, does workshops about reproductive and sexual rights for young women. And Yolimar Mejia is an industrial engineer, worked for many years in the oil industry, is part of the Brazil's landless workers movement, and also works in the Todas Nosotras Violeta uh, organization. They uh, started in many of their talks, they gave a context to what's happening in Venezuela. They talked about the uh, decades of poverty and corruption under the neoliberal governments and where Venezuela was essentially a petro colony of the United States. And now they see themselves in the second fight for independence, not from Spain, but now from the United States. And the election of Chavez, uh, Hugo Chavez in 1999 began a, a Bolivarian political revolution, a a new independent path for Venezuela, rejecting the hegemony of the United States, using their resources to fight the poverty and hunger uh, and services for their people, promoting regional integration, a new constitution that gave many rights to many marginalized communities. The US sees all of this as a threat to their domination, like a gangster, punishing anyone who defies their rule. And, and to set an example for others, they will punish anyone who defies their rule. Because if they succeed, the ones who defy their rule, that will inspire other countries and show people, especially in, the, in North America, that there exists an alternative to a neoliberal model. And that, leads, that has led, led to such inequality and poverty. There's a quote by Elliot Abrams, a neocon from the US government who said, we have um, worked all over the world to show that socialism does not work and we cannot let Venezuela be an exception. And that's, I think that th shows the thinking of the US government at this time. <clears throat> they, this punishment uh, takes the form of, uh, and these are things that uh, the three, uh, Venezuelan women elaborated in their talks that takes the form of economic terrorism, hundreds of cruel and illegal coercive measures, illegal by the UN Charter and all international law, violating the basic human rights by limiting access to food, medicine, and basic goods to the whole population, causing thousands of deaths, the theft of assets, uh, gold, money, uh, blocking trade and financial transactions, sabotage of the infrastructure, and the kidnapping and torture of a diplomat, Alex Saab, as you just heard about, who was simply trying to secure uh, food and medicine for his people. Truly, the US government, by these measures, could be considered the largest uh, example of organized crime in history. The women uh, frequently mention that the goals and methods of these sanctions can be easily seen by looking at the own words of the US government. There was a 
famous quote by the former Ambassador Brownfeld, who said, one, um, paraphrasing, one of the goals uh, and the main goal was to create despair, hunger, and economic collapse in Venezuela so that they overthrow their government. And also they pointed out regularly that North Americans can look, or anyone that has any doubts, can go to the Department of Treasury website where all the hundreds of um, coercive measures are laid out and easy to see. They often commented that they're being punished for their achievements, for empowering the poor, and that all of this has become worse since Barack Obama in 2015 declared Venezuela an unusual threat to the security of the United States. They, are, they also expressed often that they're very worried that there are plans in Congress to make the sanctions against Venezuela uh, a permanent law. And uh, that would be very dangerous. Um, <clears throat> some specific things that each of them shared in their talks. Yolamar talked about the loss of state revenues due to the sanctions, which uh, created very um, drop in salaries and a loss of jobs. The lack of spare parts for infrastructure, specifically she highlighted the supplies needed for surgeries, uh, neonatal surgeries the rise in maternal and infant mortality, limited access to vital imported medicines, contraceptions, uh, contraceptives included, causing a rise in teen pregnancy, the lack of fuel and fertilizers, which created an effect of uh, the drop in food production and the difficulty to distribute food. Angie talked often about the indigenous rights that are embedded in the new constitution, the importance, she's also very involved in the, in the internal intense debate about abortion in Venezuela. She talked, being on the border with Colombia, she saw much evidence of many professionals being for, uh, in desperate situations, being forced to migrate because of the lack of jobs due to the lack of revenue. Um, her mother, um, she often mentioned that her mother developed a curriculum to teach indigenous language and culture in the schools. And this, uh, her work is actually featured in a Smithsonian um, book about education here in the United States. Monica, an Afro-Venezuelan, talked about the increased stress in the families and the increase in domestic violence uh, during this period of sanctions. She said her own mother died from a stroke by not being able to access emergency care they, she highlighted how so many families, and especially women, have to spend long lines to get basic goods and food, personal hygiene products. And she talked about how she had to use uh, torn up pieces of uh, clothes in, because there were no sanitary napkins. She, ma she maintains through her group the rich Afro-Venezuelan musical traditions and thinks this um, preserving these traditions has helped over comes some of the stress that people are suffering. All three shared that they are not here in the United States to ask for humanitarian aid. They just want our solidarity and the lifting of all sanctions. They also shared they are not just victims, but they represent a resilient and courageous people. And as, as shown by the millions of people who went out to vote for their government, knowing that it will result in a continued US aggression. And they often said that just being on this tour itself, sharing with the US population is a form of breaking the blockade. At the People Summit in Los Angeles, they echoed the importance of defending the right to sovereignty of all nations, which is the most basic right that the United Nations was founded on. And like the pandemic, and the climate crisis, the global predatory capitalism is a threat to all people and requires a global effort to resist it. Venezuelans um, is now the central target of US aggression in this historical conflict of the corporate elites against the working class and poor of the world. And Venezuela is on the front lines of this struggle with much courage and resilience. It is standing up to the criminal behavior of the US government 
And in a real sense, they are fighting for us as well and therefore should be defended because Venezuela is also attempting to build and organize an example of a more just and inclusive society, it must be supported in that effort, not blockaded. As these three women did, we need to make more visible the impact of the criminal sanction policy of the United States and, and Canada, which is sustained by an information war of propaganda with Orwellian claims that they are protecting human rights while they are limiting access to food, medicines, and fuel. We could show people what it would be like if a foreign country blocked access to food and medicines for our families. What would they think? They often spoke <clears throat> of how the Bolivarian Revolution is a process with achievements and mistakes, many challenges, but is constantly reinventing and reevaluating itself. I feel our main responsibility as citizens of empire should not be to always scrutinize how they resist imperialism, constantly critique what strategic economic and political decisions they make to survive this onslaught of economic war, but rather defend, simply defend their right to self-determination and to choose their own leaders. The US and Canadian people are being blocked also from the truth and impact of these policies and from learning about the alternative society that they're trying to build in Venezuela. We need to tell the truth that these women also came here to share. They're simply asking to be respected. They stated that the consciousness and dignity that was ignited and embodied in their ongoing Bol Bolivarian revolution will never die. I think that these three Venezuelan sisters who came on this tour are a very good example of that. Thank you. Thank you very much, David Paul, and also for your efforts to help organize that important tour. After um, years of, of COVID-19 pandemic and not being able to have in-person events, I think it's incredibly important uh, if we are able to work to bring people from Venezuela to the United States or Canada, because one impact of sanctions and blockade is that they're the US government or the government of Canada is, is really trying to cut people off, poor working and oppressed people in Canada and the US off uh, from our co-fighters, our compañeros and compañeras in, in Venezuela um, so that we cannot identify with their struggle or understand the impact of sanctions. And so I, I think the tour sounds like a great success and I'm very uh, glad uh, that you were able to be part of it and share just a piece of it with us here today. Uh, I put a link in the chat that has some video and some photos from the tour, and um, hmm. hopefully we can think about doing something like that similar here in Canada and the U.S. again uh, before too long. Thank you so much, uh, especially for emphasizing just why people in the U.S. and Canada need to stand with Venezuela against these criminal sanctions and attacks. Welcome. Next, uh, we have uh, Ken Stone. Ken is joining us uh, from Hamilton, Ontario. He is a longtime anti-war, labor, anti-racism, and environmental activist and treasurer of the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War, as well as an executive member of the Syria Solidarity Movement. The floor is yours, Ken. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me, Allison. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. And what I want to say is uh, about Canada. I want to say that in our opinion, uh, in the peace movement, the malfeasance of the Trudeau government towards the Venezuelan government and people is largely due to a lack of a independent foreign policy in Canada. Most days in Canada, when we pick up the newspaper, watch the TV, we are embarrassed and we, by, the, by the decisions of the Canadian government towards Venezuela and many other countries of the world. And, and we wonder why we, we bother in Ottawa having a chic foreign minister such as Madame Jolie, when all she does is take orders from the, or take her line from the State Department of the United States of America 
and why we have this young, suave, well-dressed uh, prime minister called Justin Trudeau, who just takes his orders from whoever happens to be the president of the United States. Um, now, um, it doesn't matter if the, uh, we might as well have, with Justin Trudeau, we might as well have Joe Biden as our, as our leader, um, or for that matter, uh, it could have been, he's not that discriminating. Uh, he took the order from uh, the former president, uh, Donald Trump, to arrest Meng Wanzhou, shamefully, uh, in a shocking display of um, Canada's, um, I would say, vassal-like status in the U.S. empire. Um, the fact is that the Trudeau government is a willing accomplice in the, uh, in the, U.S. empire, and it profits by it. Um, but some people say that there's no alternative available to in Canada, that we couldn't possibly have an independent foreign policy. Look, we have this a huge, powerful neighbor, the most powerful country in the world to our south. We have this huge, long border with it. Uh, we have a, a great economic dependence on them. They are our major trading partner. Uh, they have, in, in fact, invaded us twice in our history. Um, and to those people, I would say, you know, there are two things I would say to them. The first one is historical precedent. There have been uh, prime ministers in the past who have shown some courage and independence in foreign policy, such as a conservative, John Diefenbaker, who stood up against the U.S. on the nuclear Bomark missiles. There was even Justin Trudeau's uh, own father, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who uh, opened diplomatic relations with Cuba and, uh, in, uh, six, over 60 years ago and has maintained, and Canada has maintained those uh, relations ever since. And years before Nixon went to uh, Beijing, uh, uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, the father of the current prime minister, uh, accepted uh, China's one state one China policy and established uh, uh, good relations with the People's Republic of China until unfortunately Justin Trudeau screwed things up uh, and uh, the, our, over the arrest of Meng Wanzhou and, and showed uh, and, and, and brought economic and uh, brought political relations and diplomatic relations, even economic relations uh, with China to a new low. Um, so that's the first point. There is a historical precedent. And secondly, um, I would like to, uh, I would tell those people who say we can't have an independent foreign policy to look south of the monster, the imperial monster to our south, look south of there to the, uh, our other partner in the US, uh, Mexico, Canada free trade agreement, our other partner in North America and namely Mexico. Um, and uh, Mexico uh, also shares a, a, a long border with the U.S. Um, it also has a, an economic dependence on the U.S., more than Canada even. Uh, it's been invaded a couple of times, but yet look at uh, President López Obrador, who refused to attend the Summit of the Americas, specifically over the continuing U.S. embargo of Cuba and over the exclusion of Nicaragua, uh, Cuba, and Venezuela from that summit. Um, I saw the other day, uh, among his uh, many other comments, which uh, show that the, uh, that the Mexican government, the Mexican president, has a sense of the sovereignty of uh, the country of Mexico and, and acts like a sovereign state, unlike Canada. Uh, Mr. Obrador said that uh, in the case of Mr. Assange, if the U.S. doesn't stop extraditing Mr. Assange, then uh, they should rename uh, the, uh, the Statue of Liberty because it's not a symbol of freedom, he, he said. It's a symbol of hypocrisy. So um, I think uh, that the main difference between uh, Canada and Mexico in, in the foreign policy is, area is that, that Mexico does exhibit an independent foreign policy, and significantly, it does not belong to NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Then Canada does, and Canada has been dragged into every war 
of the US empire uh, because of our membership in NATO. And I'm speaking specifically of Yugoslavia, Afghanistan, Libya, Iraq, and Syria. Uh, and now we have been dragged into uh, the war, the US proxy war in Ukraine, uh, which um, has gotten to the point that we now have Canadian special forces, Canadian soldiers in uniform in Ukraine, uh, and they've been there since uh, January or February. So we are technically at war with Russia. And this is because of our membership in NATO which drags us into all these imperial wars. Um, I'd like to note that um, the uh, government of uh, Peru, uh, whose capital is Lima, how in the last year or so, uh, acknowledged, it withdrew from the Lima group. And uh, the, um, they acknowledged that the uh, joining the Lima group by the government of Peru was the greatest foreign policy mistake in the entire history of two centuries of, or, or more of the government of Peru. Um, but unlike Peru, Canada has doubled down uh, on the Lima group and in supporting the uh, pretender, uh, the US pretender in Venezuela for president, namely Juan Guaido. Um, I'll just... Uh, I'll just mention a couple of things that Canada has done recently. Um, and I'm referring here to an article by Owen Schalk, uh, July 11th in Canadian Dimension. And what he, what he writes is that following the ninth summit of the Americas in California, Trudeau allocated almost $900,000 in funding for the Venezuelan opposition. This funding will go to programs to, quote, strengthen the leadership capacities of Venezuelan women from the political opposition and to build the leadership capacities of Venezuelan women from the Venezuelan interim government and the opposition-led National Assembly, end of quote. So uh, this is part of Trudeau's faux or pseudo-feminist foreign policy, which uh, supposedly um, supposedly benefits um, women in the, the uh, global south, but actually as Mr. Uh, Paul in, his, in the previous speech uh, indicated, um, the policy actually increases the policy of sanctions, criminal sanctions against Venezuela and the recognition of the Juan Guaido government it contributes to the oppression and suffering of women in Venezuela. One month later, according to Mr. Schalk, Canada signed a media freedom coalition statement to, quote, express their deep concern over the lack of media freedom in Venezuela and condemn the repressive measures employed by the, by the Maduro regime, end of quote. Again, here's more hypocrisy from uh, the Trudeau government. Um, in Canada, the media is controlled by a handful of media companies that control all the newspapers, radio stations, and TV stations, and no alternatives to the government line are permitted on those media outlets in the mainstream media in Canada. For example, when the, when the Canadian peace movement had demonstrations across the country in a week of protests from June 24th to June 30th, not one media outlet covered any of the 15 or so protests that stretched from Victoria on one in the West to Halifax in the East. Um, moreover, uh, the, our, uh, following the sum, uh, just before the Summit of the Americas, I believe it was, uh, um, our Sheikh Foreign Minister, um, Madame Jolie, uh, met with the Deputy Minister of the Foreign Affairs for the Venezuelan interim government and co-founder of Women for Democracy in Venezuela. I'm reading from the uh, from Global Affairs Canada government website, June the 1st. Um, the minister she met and the uh, Madame Jolie met the uh, Isadora Zubiaga, deputy minister of Juan Guaido's Venezuelan interim government. And they discussed uh, the role, women's role in building a more inclusive society. So clearly the Canadian government under uh, Mr. Trudeau is doubling down 
um, rather than backing away fr from uh, the uh, US su supported uh, attempt for regime change in, um, in Venezuela is doubling down on this, on, on criminal sanctions and on the attempt to overthrow the Bolivarian revolution, which has brought so much, uh, which until, the, which ha had brought so much promise to the people of Venezuela. I would like to conclude uh, by saying that Canada, again, needs an independent foreign policy. We have to get out of NATO. Uh, we have to start acting like a sovereign country and start supporting the, uh, truly supporting the struggles of people in the global south. I regret that up to now, uh, there's not even been a single sliver of light in, in Ottawa, not only the government, uh, has treated the Venezuelan people with contempt, contempt but also the opposition parties have been, uh, have been absent, missing in action when it comes to uh, uh, arguing with the Canadian government in any significant way over its uh, sanctions against Venezuela and its treatment to, uh, of the Venezuelan government, which is... Uh, uh, amounts to regime uh, an attempt at regime change. Hopefully, however, I can report to you that there are some behind the scenes developments and I hope at the next Venezuelan picket organized by Mawo in August, that I have some good news to report about some new developments that are taking place behind the scenes up in Ottawa. And hopefully there will be some good news and some sliver of light in that swamp that uh, on Parliament Hill. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Thank you, Ken Stone, uh, for bringing uh, Canada, especially into our discussion here today. And also, I, I think uh, something we must demand within our anti-war work, our, our work as peace-loving people, is the normalization of relations between Venezuela and Canada between the US government and Venezuela. Um, it impacts all of us and it is disgusting and angering how much the government of Canada uh, can speak out of both sides of its mouth when it comes to so-called uh, sovereignty or issues of, of self-determination and completely violate that for the, the people of Venezuela. Um, and so uh, we, we must continue as, as we have been doing and in, in working together to make sure Venezuela is included in our anti-war work, especially when it comes to Canada's sanctions, which are an act of war against Venezuela. Thank you very much for joining today. So our, our final speaker before uh, we're going to play actually a, a video after Jose Luis, and then uh, that's when people can kind of get ready for the group photo and the participatory picket aspect of our event, um, as well as we'll hear greetings from people across Canada. But I wanted to uh, really give a big welcome to our last speaker, who is Jose Luis Granado Seja who I had the pleasure of meeting just, uh, it feels like just a few months ago in, in Venezuela in December um, during an elections observation um, delegation, I believe. Jose Luis can correct me if it was before that, but I think it was just a few months ago. And uh, Jose Luis is a journalist based in Mexico City. Uh, he is a staff writer with Venezuela Analysis and a host of their podcast, which is really an invaluable source of information for people who want to know more about Venezuela and beyond the mainstream media headlines. Jose Luis also works on a freelance basis covering Latin America, including topics such as elections, social movements, migration, and human rights, and uh, really appreciate all of the work that you do. Um, so it is an honor to have you here. And the floor is yours, Jose Luis. Great, thank you so much for having me. And thanks to all the other presenters tonight. It's been really informative uh, and, and really excellent hearing the different perspectives. I really appreciate hearing about the tour. And I'm just gonna build off uh, what Ken was talking about. And I, and I think it's also really important for us to have a critical view in particular of Canada. I think um, this being an event that's hosted by many activists in Canada, but uh, you know, the insidious role that I think that Canada 
place, particularly in Latin America, I think deserves more scrutiny. And I'm, and I'm really glad that the, that attention is being played. I think in some ways uh, it can be easy. I'll slow down a little bit for the interpreters. It can be easy to criticize, to point out the actions of US imperialism. And obviously it's important that we do so and, and continue to do so. But I think uh, in some ways, policymakers in Ottawa are very much aware of the fact that Canada can precisely play that junior imperialist role in trying to be surreptitious in terms of its, of its actions in the world and in Latin America in particular. Why do I say that? Because Canada has deliberately cultivated this image of itself in the international community as being someone who's in favor of peace and non-intervention. Now, those of us who are familiar with history know that that's not the case whatsoever, but that doesn't mean that the enemies of social progress, the, the enemies of the Bolivarian Revolution, aren't aware of that reputation that Canada has in the world and uses it in order to try to justify the actions of imperialism. Right? I, you have to really remember that uh, the Lima Group was mentioned you know, that uh, the U.S., even though it was very much active, that the OES, which is the Ministry of Colonies of the United States, was also very active, was actually, the U.S. was never actually a formal member. In fact, that role of guiding the actions and decisions that came out of the Lima Route were largely dictated by the liberal government in Ottawa. And so, anyway, I, I mentioned that because I think it, it ties into a little bit of what I want to mention tonight. So, uh, you know, I was asked to talk a little about, about the regional situation uh, beyond the U.S. and Canada. Uh, so just the other day in their presentation, Maduro was talking about how the, the meeting between López Obrador, which uh, we also heard about the Mexico's foreign policy, uh, his meeting with Joe Biden. And in that meeting, um, you know, it was it, it, it came about as a result of the the this, the Summit of the Americas, wherein Lopez Obrador, as was previously mentioned, decided to openly boycott the event, sending a lower level delegation in, in, in his place. And I think that's important and I mention it because I think that that is somewhat extraordinary in the sense that we probably would not have seen that sort of posture from any government in the region, but in particular Mexico, with its important relationship with the United States in the 20th century. And yet we saw it happen here. And I think that speaks to the, the level of advancement of anti-imperialist thought that exists in the region. And I make a point of saying anti-imperialist thought because even though Lopez Obrador is probably, to my recollection, never talked about US imperialism, uh, he nonetheless maintains an anti-imperialist position. And I've mentioned this in other occasions, and I, and I like to reiterate it, but if we remember the, the Juan Guaido self-proclamation as president a number of years ago, you know, we, we, we understand that this was actually a, a strategy that had been planned out previously. They had put the pieces in place throughout the region, tapping on the U.S. and Canada's allies in the region. So as to say, well, look, this 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 character Juan Maido has declared himself president, and therefore well, we should recognize it. We've seen these other states, and, and in that case, if I remember correctly, it was Brazil, Chile, Ecuador, uh, and Uruguay, a handful of countries from Latin America. So, as if to say, there's a consensus, you know, that that the those of you that continue to recognize Maduro are the ones who are who are out of step and to make it seem like it was something that had a lot of momentum. And I remember watching it live as it was taking place, as news was coming out and people were starting to mobilize. And, you know, there's a lot of question in terms of what exactly this meant Would the militaries, uh, you know, remain loyal to the constitution and to the democratically elected government of Nicolas Maduro, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but there was one key thing that happened. And it was probably, I think, if I'm remembering again correctly, around 11 o'clock in the morning, where the government of Mexico under Lopez Obrador says, Hang on a second. We continue to recognize Maduro. And that really slowed down the momentum. It really made it seem that actually, no, there isn't consensus on this. Actually, there is, this is a controversial issue. You can't just unilaterally change who you recognize as the government. And I think that really served to slow down what effectively, what we now understand to be a, you know, a, a, a long planned and uh, uh, a long, long planned coup attempt against the democratically elected government. 
in Venezuela. And I think that that's, that's particularly significant because as we know now, uh, Juan Guaido was never actually able to consolidate that coup. The opposition was not able to actually exercise any kind of influence. And now they're a laughing stock. And I think we should be clear about that. You know, and, and uh, you know, it's interesting if you read English language mainstream coverage, uh, they'll, you know, they'll still re refer to him as the interim government, all this kind of stuff, but they do sneaky things. Um, and if you're interested in, in sort of a breakdown, we often do break down the mainstream media's coverage of Venezuela on Venezuela's Twitter feed. Um, it's not myself, it's actually somebody else from the team, but we have a lot of fun with it. Um, we do like to make fun of, of the mainstream media and their, and their poor coverage. But anyway, to get back to that, what they, what, what they did end up saying is Juan Maido, who was originally recognized by 60 odd on countries, that's far from the case today, but they continue to employ that kind of language. If we want to know in terms of who is actually uh, rec continues to recognize why I think the best rubric that we can use is what are their votes at the UN General Assembly and overwhelmingly the countries of the world, in particular those of Latin America, recognize Maduro. It's Maduro who, who, who uh, it's the Maduro government who has the seat at the UN General Assembly. And if you look at the last vote, which I believe it happened in January in terms of who gets the credentials, it was only 16 countries that backed why those claims. So that's a very small number compared to the original. And I think that if, if these uh, media outlets were, were more responsible or more loyal to the truth, that they would actually report that figure as opposed to, to one that is no longer relevant. But nonetheless, what does that change due to? It's also changed uh, uh, due to a, a shift in the political landscape in the region. And, and I think it's important that we do celebrate the fact that in the face of a crisis of capitalism, in the world that the peoples of Latin America, one of the means that they're using in order to try to confront these crises is the election of leftist and progressive governments. And we've seen it, uh, you know, to, with, with mixed results, admittedly, right? Uh, you know, we saw the election of Castillo in Peru, we saw the election of Boric in Chile, uh, and we saw the election most recently of, of Petro in Colombia, and quite likely, uh, unless there's a coup there, uh, or, or some other unscrupulous acts of Lula's return to the presidency in Brazil. No, so I started out talking about the need to, to, to defend the anti-imperialist line or anti-imperialist thinking. Uh, even if we don't use that language, I understand that the different scenarios will require us to use different kinds of language. Um, but I do think that the principles in the same way that Mexico's Lopez Obrador has done it uh, are really, really important to maintain. Why do I say that? So if we look at other neighbors in South America, let's take the case of Gabriel Boric in Chile. So Boric, uh, you know, I'm not going to get into so much of his, his domestic policy, but he's not having a good time, right? His, his approval rating is, is rapidly dropping. It's actually running the risk of undermining support for the new constitution, which actually is, is an incredible document with a lot of really important measures. Uh, but on the international uh, scene, it's been troubling. And uh, unfortunately, what we have seen, uh, I wager to say that he has tried to accommodate Chile's foreign policy to the dictates of Washington. Uh, and that's worrisome and I think it needs to be criticized. And, I, and then uh, what you will see from the Boric government is what I call the instrumentalization of human rights. So there's this emphasis and there's a very long tradition inside of Chile of defense and promotion of human rights. Um, but unfortunately, it's being misused in this instance. So what Boric is trying to say is that his foreign policy is guided by a commitment to human rights and criticizes the government in Venezuela for alleged human rights violations. But the problem with that kind of discourse is that we have to remember that, that uh, human rights are actually interdependent, right? You can't single out. You can't say, oh, because there was, you know, uh, accusations of, of a heavy handed response by state security forces that human rights are being violated in Venezuela. If you're not going to talk about the other guarantees that the Venezuelan government is engaging in, in order to meet all of its obligations, including to the human rights related to social, economic, cultural rights, which is something that Venezuela is miles ahead in terms of its policies domestically. And so this instrumentalization of human rights allows Boric to try to, try to kind, his government to try to kind of like cut a path, 
which is to say we're different from our predecessor. And in some instance, in, in some regards, Boric's government is different from Piñera's uh, in the sense that, yeah, they're no longer pursuing the diplomatic isolation of Venezuela the way that Piñera did. That part is true, uh, but it's not enough. And, and, I, and that's kind of the point that I want to stress when it comes to, to Chile. That's, it's not enough to simply uh, move away from only one of the damaging aspects of the previous foreign policy, because what is Boric doing? So even though he criticized the US's decision to exclude Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua from the Summit of the Americas, he went and attended. In contrast to Lopez Obrador, who not only criticized, but opted to Lucho Arce, who criticized and decided not to go to many countries of the Caribbean that similarly criticized. And that's actually far more important that, that those messages be delivered in that way, as opposed to relying on only a, a soft criticism. And I think it's also important to note, and you know, I spoke a little bit about Canada, what was Boric's uh, behavior in Canada? It was an appeal to the to the to Canadian capital, you know, there wasn't a necessarily an effort to connect with the Canadian working class or to the diaspora community, which is very large in Canada, the Chilean community. But no, you know, I, I, um, he ended up speaking to a gathering of, I believe it was um, representatives from Canada's um, mining companies if I'm not mistaken, but it was generally, you know, we'd safe to say a, a gathering of Canada's business leaders. And what did he say there? I'm not the next Maduro. You know, that's a pitch that he's making. He's trying to say, well, I'm on the side of the, of capital, not necessarily workers. And so I think it's important to criticize also, who did he pick to be his foreign minister? Urrejola. Who is she? She was actually a, um, a public servant in the Organization of American States from 2018 to 2021, which coincides with the rule of Luis Almagro as Secretary General of the OAS. And so that's troublesome. That's why you saw uh, the very sharp critique of Venezuelan Vice President Delcy Rodriguez of her comments in Spain, talking about um, you know, the alleged human rights violations in Venezuela. She said she was a stooge of Luis Almagro. You know? And, and so um, similarly, Chile, was, one, was the single Latin American country that signed the Media Freedom Coalition statement that was referred to earlier. That again is troublesome. And that's what I say about the instrumentation of human rights. All right, switching now to Petro and Colombia. And in, in a lot of ways, it was kind of surprising because if you've been following Petro and if you're somewhat aware of the political realities in Colombia, uh, it's been long dominated by, by a conservative uh, politics by far right politics, Uribismo uh, represents a danger not just to Colombians, uh, literally they, through its um, tacit support of paramilitary actions and its heavy use of the state of state repressive forces uh, while in power, uh, but to humanity itself uh, because of because of its ties to organized crime and all that. And so it, um, that's not to say that. The, that Colombia is inherently a conservative country. I always kind of balk at those kinds of comments when you read them in the, in the press that are oh, a historically conservative country. No, the, the right wing in Colombia was quite good at being able to leverage the power that it did have in order to perpetuate itself in power. Now, so given that context, we saw Petro trying to make an appeal to, uh, to a broad public that effectively worked because we saw that he, he was elected, but he made some troublesome comments saying, actually equating Nicolás Maduro to Álvaro Uribe. And that's an absurd comparison to make. They have very, they have little to nothing in common. Um, but, you know, I think we should recognize for what that is, you know, is an attempt to try to distance themselves because the specter of Venezuela, as it is here in Mexico, in many other countries often raise, oh, if you elect a leftist, then you're going to turn into to Venezuela. Of course, they don't talk about why Venezuela is in the multi-factor crisis that it's in, and it's far more to do with U.S. imperialism uh, than it does in terms of any kind of uh, mistakes that may have been made in uh, domestically and economic policy. Uh, so that being said, despite the fact that that Petro was in, in, in you know in some in some ways a little worrisome, what direction was he going to go? You know, was was he going to jump onto this bandwagon? 
uh, you know, one of the few places where perhaps Guaido does have some support is amongst the the, the Colombian population and Venezuelans in Colombia, although even there, it's pretty limited. But what have we seen recently? Uh, just last week, he said he wanted to return Monomeros. Monomeros is is, an, uh, is um, a subsidiary of a state-owned company from Venezuela called Pequeven. That's really important. It's considered Venezuela's second most important foreign asset, second only to Citgo. Uh, it was similarly like Citgo, seized, stolen, and handed over to the interim government of, of, of Juan Maido, which totally bungled the company. So this company, Monomeros, plays an incredibly important role in terms of the agricultural sector, uh, not just in, in Venezuela, but, but particularly in, inside Colombia, uh, providing key ingredients for, for agriculture production, namely fertilizer. It's been so thoroughly mismanaged by the opposition that the actual Colombian state, under a right-wing government, was forced to, in a sense, no, not officially, nationalize the company to put it under state-run control because of the men's management, because of the importance it plays in terms of the actual agricultural production inside of Colombia. And so now with Petro's incoming government, he said, we should return it. And that is, and I think it would establish a very important precedent that these historically poor decisions, you know, we heard this mention of the, the former foreign minister in, in Peru under Castillo's government saying that this was the first foreign policy decision that had been made, can be reversed. That they, that they can establish that precedent of things returning to the way that they should be, you know, uh, and and that um, and this in the case of, of returning this a very important asset to the its rightful owners, which is the democratically elected government of Venezuela, which is Nicolas Maduro. Second, I th why do I think the election of Petro is is important, and why I am encouraged by these early signs? Well, you know, they talked about once again reestablishing diplomatic and economic ties. That's very important. Venezuela and Colombia have had a very long relationship of cooperation together. And so, in, in terms of even just attending to the needs of the millions of Colombians in Venezuela and the millions of Venezuelans that are in Colombia, it's going to go a long way. But one thing that I'm also encouraged by is that Colombia will cease to be the staging ground for, you, for interventions against Venezuela. That I think is also really critical. So uh, a lot of the destabilization efforts come from Colombia. A lot, it's, it's, you know, it, as I said, a staging ground for these kinds of. We, we know the most infamously the case of the so-called humanitarian aid, which we now know was uh, uh, always was a stunt to try to prompt a regime change inside of of. Uh, of Venezuela. In, in fact, you know, we saw very recently that Bolton was in the news because of his comments boasting about his uh, his support and backing of coups. What he's referring to when he made those comments, even though he didn't elaborate, is his role in supporting the interim so-called government of Juan Maido and it's uh, in its efforts to, to, to affect regime change there. So in that sense, it's, it's, it's encouraging. The other thing that I think people should pay attention to in terms of the international scenario uh, likely this week or next, we're going to be hearing um, the the ruling from UK courts of Venezuela's gold, which I'm sure has been covered here during the pickets a lot. So it's very important to pay attention to that. Uh, again, because uh, because it, the that case in particular is really worrisome. Uh, I invite uh, all, all, all the people that are participating to to check out our coverage of Venezuela analysis. Uh, we'll be sure to to be writing about that, but. You know, it's it's uh, the previous ruling was actually uh, based on a sort of absurd concept on, in in UK, and I'll I'll put it up here. Um, but basically, making making the 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 case that the one voice policy applies in this situation. So, because Theresa May, who was then prime minister, decided to recognize Juan Maido. Therefore, the courts must follow that. And basically, it's going to be uh, the legitimization of the theft of resources. And so that speaks to just how fraudulent this kind of language that you'll often see employed by the spokespeople of, of imperialism saying, oh, we must respect you know, the rules-based international order. 
uh, in that sense, the, it's always you know rules for thee and not for me. So if we if, if we truly lived in a in a world that actually abided by a rules based international order, then you wouldn't be able to unilaterally change who you recognize as the government and use that as a basis to steal their resources. Um, so anyway, um, just to conclude, uh, even though I, I spent a lot of time uh, pointing out some of the uh, you know, the, the, the less encouraging comments that have come from some of the region's leaders. Overall, I do want to end on this point. I'm optimistic. I think we should be optimistic uh, because what this realignment of, politic, of politics in the region allows for is for a strengthened region to be able to assert its sovereignty in the way that Cuba does it, in the way that Venezuela does it. So that it, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the states that are smaller in terms of their ability to kind of uh, to, to take positions that would put them at odds with Washington and put them in the crosshairs. You know, uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago or last week, we saw this, this story from the New York Times criticizing the U.S. ambassador to Mexico for being too cozy with Lopez Obrador. And that was largely based on anonymous sources in Washington. When you see that kind of thing, uh, we should understand what it is. It's, it's, it's the, the agents of imperialism planting stories to try to undermine figures like Lopez Obrador for daring to, to stand up to US imperialism. So as you have a wave of leftist and progressive leaders elected newly, uh, it allows for more breathing room. And critically, one of the ways that we can actually uh, start to, tr to, to chart an independent path to start to break away from the chains of imperialism is around regional integration. And regional integration is far more possible when you have consensus on those kinds of basic issues of respect for, for human rights, but not in sort of the liberal conception that comes from the United States. Uh, when we have a, a consensus around the need to reorient the economies towards the well being of the vast majority of the country's citizens, of this idea that uh, it that concrete steps need to be taken in order to overcome neocolonialism and the legacy of colonialism in the region. And, you know, it's important to, to recognize because of that historical moment that Latin American countries were integrated into the international economy, our place in the international division of, of labor makes it so it's actually far easier to continue to be uh, Economies are oriented around primary goods, around the, the, the selling of, of, of those and the import of value added commodities and things like that. That transformation, the, in order for it to take place, in order to, 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 to change that kind of orientation, uh, you know, requires a shift in perspective as opposed to looking towards Europe, looking towards North America, but actually looking to, to our neighbors and, and promoting uh, development that favors, like I mentioned, the vast majority. And I think that's far more possible with the, the, the new wave of uh, progressive and leftist governments that have been elected in the region. And it also allows for there to be a radicalization of processes, right? One of the deep key differences, I think, from what was called the pink wave and this new wave is that the first pink wave was in a lot of ways buoyed by the you know the high price of commodities about uh, with with China's in, interest in, in 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 securing new relationships and new sources of of key resources for them that's less the case today which means that the effort to actually attend to the needs of the population in Latin America is going to require inevitably some kind of confrontation with capital and the interests of the ruling class throughout the region and that as Venezuela well knows, um, is a far riskier situation, but can also produce a far better situation in terms of actually redistributing the wealth. And so uh, as the, the region's leaders come to face with the reality that they're going to have to, you know, invariably come up against the interests of the ruling class, well, it's far easier to do that if you're coming together as a bloc. You know, that, that you, there won't be this effort to isolate a country for daring to do what's necessary to actually, you know, uh, to, to, to meet what the, the constitution of the, our country's demand, to meet the, the, the so demands of social movements, to, to, to actually um, 
you know, finally bury neoliberalism and inaugurate, at least from my perspective, an era uh, of socialism, an actual uh, de deliberate effort taking concrete steps to establish socialism in the region. And, and, and now just to conclude on that, I do think that that is really important, not just for the region, but for the world, because it'll show that a better world is indeed possible because we're building it. But to get there, we really do require uh, the support of people like, like all of you who are participating in this and in confronting and resisting imperialism where you find it. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jose Luis. Um, I think uh, out of many different things you said, we could probably have a very fulsome, important discussion, and, and we should have one. Um, I really appreciate uh, bringing in so much perspective um, and especially, uh, you know, really understanding, which I think we need to more, why Venezuela is such a, a critical linchpin in it comes to when it comes to you fighting against US hegemony in Latin America, how um, Venezuela being able to continue to resist with their democratically elected government to fight sanctions uh, can still play such a critical role alongside Cuba with developing social movements and newly elected governments. Um, and also for the optimism you shared, because as you uh, have very well experienced, I think something we face in uh, the struggle in solidarity with Latin America or in anti-war movements, especially in Canada or the US is people saying, we can't change anything. Nothing's gonna happen no matter what we do. And so we have to have that sense of optimism and really learn and understand better more about people that are fighting and winning uh, throughout Latin America. So thanks so much. Before we have greetings from a few people across Canada, we have, uh, of course, a very important space in our monthly pickets, which is to hear from Professor Luis Acuna, who is the former governor of the state of Sucre in Venezuela. And uh, for groups across Canada, we are very fortunate that he is also the charge de affairs of the Venezuelan embassy in Canada. Due to uh, Canada's breakdown of diplomatic relations with Venezuela. He's not able to be here in Canada performing his duties as the Charge d'Affaires, but he is uh, able to join us on the monthly pickets and is continuing his important work from Venezuela. So good to have you here with us, Professor Luis Acuna, direct from Venezuela. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Alison. Good evening to, to everybody. I want to thank all the people who joined the uh, webinar for their solidarity with Venezuela. I want to thank uh, Vanessa Ortiz, David Paul, Ken Stone, and Jose Luis Granados, because uh, they did a very, very good, they were very good speakers tonight. Uh, to um, Vanessa, I want to assess that we will keep fighting for Aletzab. Venezuela won't leave Aletzab alone. We think that Aletzab did nothing but to help Venezuela, and we will do everything we can to bring Aletzab back to Venezuela. We are sure we will be able to do so because we have to write. Uh, we, we know that the US is uh, punishing uh, Alex Saab, because he was able to break the laws that the U.S. put uh, with uh, to us regarding uh, getting food, getting medicines for the Venezuelan people. And I want to assess that David Paul did it very well re regarding how the sanctions, how the unilateral, uh, the coercive unilateral measure have uh, affected Venezuela. We are still very much affected for those uh, uh, sanctions. Uh, they not only affected the economy of Venezuela, they affected everybody. They affected the ability of people to get food, to get medicine, to get uh, uh, dress, they affected all our industry. So many, many people lost their jobs and they have to go out for, for working. Uh, 
uh, to countries in Latin America and every place they could go because they have to work. Young people very well formed in our universities who were unable to work because all the industry uh, have to shut down because the sanctions. So this uh, uh, explanation of David Paul was very good uh, and not more that than than what he said, I can say at this moment. And one thing that uh, that I want to to assess is that uh, can Canada actually, uh, and that is something that Mr. Jolly said, the only government they recognize in Venezuela is the government of the interim president. So they don't recognize any of the uh, institutions under Presidente Maduro. That's why we cannot be in, in Canada. They don't recognize the diplomats of, uh, of Presidente Maduro. And that, are, that is affect, affecting very much to the Venezuelans in Canada because we cannot help them with any of the consular uh, actions they need. Our embassy is open and our embassy is working only with uh, local people, but no diplomats. So we don't have uh, an authorized uh, signature for all the, the actions in, in matter of uh, consular actions. And that's why we cannot help Venezuelans. And Canada is not, I mean, it's not considering any any possibility at this moment. We see how the US moved to Venezuela, sit uh, representative of President Biden, sit with President Maduro, but Canada still stick to uh, Juan Guaido and the people of Juan Guaido. Uh, I am sure that this is going to change. And I don't know what Canada is going to say once they recognize this terrible mistake they did with uh, Juan Guaido. Recognizing Juan Guaido, as a matter of fact, uh, Canada was the leader of the, the Lima group. And Canada has been the, the strongest supporter of the interim president Juan Guaido. Uh, we we will keep working. We will keep uh, uh, working for the, I mean, for the possibility of having the sanction of Venezuela. Uh, we are sure that we will be able to do so. At this moment, we see some kind of uh, of actions that means that. Venezuela could go a little bit more of where we were last year, for example. At this moment, we are able to ship oil to Europe, for example, something that we, we were not able to do last year. And uh, I am sure that things will change. Today, for example, we are fighting our goal that is retained in United Kingdom. We know that the United Kingdom wants to steal that goal, but we will keep fighting for that goal and we will keep fighting for all the assets that we were uh, depleted for the US. For example, the company Citgo or the Monomeros in, in Colombia. Uh, we will keep fighting and we are sure we will succeed because we have the right. Uh, in this moment, I want to tell to the Venezuelans who live in Canada that we are sure that at any moment we will be able to help them with all the needs they, they, they require in consular actions. Uh, today, we start again issuing passports. We, were, we stopped for three weeks, but today we start again. The appointments will be, people will be receiving their letter for appointments, and we will keep working we won't stop we don't have diplomats there but we have uh, our embassy open 
and uh, we are sure that at any moment we will be able at least to start the uh, consular actions. So thanks, uh, Alison. Thanks very much for this opportunity for people in Canada to know about what is happening in Venezuela. These uh, these speakers of tonight spoke very very well about our situation, and uh, we are sure they understand. We want again to thank not only to the speaker. We want to thank all the people who are joining the webinar because that's the solidarity for us. And we want to thank you for this 17th in a row uh, webinar in behalf of the people of Venezuela. Thanks very much, Alison. Thanks very much to everybody. Thank you, Professor Luisa Cunha uh, for making the time to join with us every month uh, to give your perspective um, about our struggle for normalization of U.S. Venezuela relations, Canada Venezuela relations, and to uh, in sanctions and uh, for all of your continued work under very difficult circumstances to build those bonds of solidarity between people in Venezuela and people in Canada and to provide the essential services that uh, Venezuelans living in Canada need. Um, of course, we have to remember that it was in fact the government of Canada that restricted Venezuelans uh, from voting in elections uh, just a few years ago. And uh, likely we'll have to continue our struggle to uh, demand that, uh, that all Venezuelans be able to participate in elections uh, coming up for the next presidential election in Venezuela. Um, on behalf of, uh, from here in Canada, I mean. Um, so uh, next we'll have two short uh, greetings, I think, if anyone is representing a group from across Canada and would like to speak tonight, you can uh, send me a message in the chat or raise your hand. But uh, for now, I have Mary Carmen Guevara, who is joining us from Alba Movimientos in Ottawa, Canada. Good evening, everybody. Good evening from Alba Social Movement here in Ottawa. We are continuing our work uh, supporting Venezuela in Latin America. These last uh, months we've been working hard with the Colombian people to support them to the election. And we are so happy that the new government and we are having hope, hope we, are, we have hopes this government will be less <laughs> problem for Venezuela. And anyway, we are continuing here supporting Venezuela. Thank you, Alison, and thank you everybody who spoke the really good information. Thank you. Gracias, Mary Carmen. Thank you, Mary Carmen. It is always great to see you. Um, we are fighting together in, in the same trenches here in Canada, and uh, it's, it's awesome to have you here today. Next, I have Janine Solenki. Janine is joining from Vancouver's Peace Coalition, Mobilization Against War and Occupation. Hello, everyone. Uh, good to be with you all today. On behalf of Mobilization Against War and Occupation, I want to thank uh, the organizers for bringing us all together in defense of our Venezuelan sisters and brothers, and uh, to the speakers for their information and analysis today. Um, I, I want to just talk quickly uh, about um, what we in Mobilization Against War and Occupation call the new era of war and occupation. Uh, which started with the U.S. invasion and occupation of Afghanistan in 2001 and has been plaguing oppressed nations around the world since. And these, uh, this new era of war and occupation takes many different um, approaches. War and occupation, of course, but also military action, bombings, uh, drone wars, um, but also uh, what we're talking about today coups and sanctions, we saw uh, or we know that the, U the United States has carried out deadly coups in Latin America and Venezuela knows this all too well. They attempted a coup 20 years ago against Venezuela's democratically elected President Hugo Chavez, again in 2019 with the U.S. puppet Guaido. Both, we must say, that were failed attempts because of the strength of Venezuela's Bolivarian revolution and the resolve of the Venezuelan people to remain sovereign 
and again and fight back against U.S. attacks. We are also standing against U.S. Uh, sanctions everywhere in the world, which they've tried to strangle Venezuela with, as long with Cuba, Iran, and many other countries that aren't following the dictates of the U.S. government. In mobilization against foreign occupation, uh, from here in Vancouver, Canada, we demand self-determination for all oppressed nations, whether it be in Yemen, Palestine, indigenous nations, Cuba, and as we're all here for today, Venezuela. We are joining with you all in demanding an end to US-Canada sanctions against Venezuela to lift uh, the blockade against Venezuela and for hands off Venezuela. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Janine Solenki, and for everyone that has joined across uh, Canada, the United States, Venezuela, a few other Latin American countries I see. It's really an honor to have joined together today at the 17th monthly picket action. Uh, we're going to start um, promoting people to participate uh, in the group photo. Uh, you will receive a message on your phone or your computer asking if you'd like to be uh, promoted to panelist. If you say yes, you will join us in uh, the space where you're actually able to turn on your camera and to participate. Whether you have a sign or not, it's all right. Uh, you can just uh, bring your face and uh, we'll put up our fists together and do some chanting. I also uh, wanted to give a big thank you to Julieta and Anna, who've been working uh, very hard to make sure our program is simultaneously uh, translated into English and Spanish, uh, which is not an easy task at all and uh, really is important for our continued ability to, to build the international movement against US, Canada and imperialist attacks on Venezuela, demanding it into sanctions and freedom for Alex Saab. Um, as a Another thank you. I just wanted to really give appreciation to all of our panelists today, some of whom uh, had to drop off early. Uh, Vanessa Ortiz, Venezuelan journalist and member of the Free Alex Saab movement. David Paul, uh, one of the Venezuelan Embassy Protection Collective and organizer of a recent tour of Venezuelan feminists in the United States. Ken Stone from the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War. Jose Luis Granado Ceja from Venezuela Analysis and also a freelance journalist living in Mexico City. Host of the podcast from Venezuela Analysis, which I'm gonna put a link for in the chat. Uh, now encourage people uh, to share and to listen to the podcast. And, um, go ahead and keep sending the invitations. Turn on your camera if you're able to. Um, as a, if you wanna go ahead and turn off interpretation, uh, we will give our interpreters a break and we will join our voices together. Thank you again to everyone. Let's work uh, to build a stronger, a, a more united movement internationally to demand no to US, Canada sanctions and attacks on Venezuela. Yes. The number of folks have turned on their cameras. It is great to see you. We did turn the interpretation off. And muy bien a ver todo que están participando en nuestra acción. No hay más interpretación profesional. Es solo yo en dos idiomas. Pero muy bien a ver todo, todo que están participando. It's so good to see everyone participating today from so many countries um, across Latin America, the United States and Canada. Um, this is our 17th action. Watch your emails and social media. We will be holding another action. Again, very important dates coming up in the case of Alex Saab. Hay ocasiones muy importante en el caso de nuestro Alex Saab. Um, August 29th is the next time he will appear in court in the United States. Um, la próxima jurídico de, de Alex Saab es en agosto y en este mes es muy importante para nosotros al mostrar nuestro apoyo para Alex Saab. In the month of August, it is going to be especially important for us to demonstrate our support for Alex Saab. 
Ok. 30 segundos más y vamos a tomar una foto. 30 more seconds and we will uh, go ahead and uh, take our photo y, uh, and uh, chant together. If you have not received the invitation, raise, raise your hand on Zoom. Si no ha recibido uh, la invitación para participar en esta otra parte del webinar, uh, por favor, levanta su mano in, in Zoom y podemos enviarte una invitación. If you haven't received the invitation yet in Zoom, um, then go ahead and uh, share, uh, raise your hand and we will send you an invitation. Okay. Necesito mi habilidad a participar también. Okay, let us raise our voices together. Free Alex Saab now. Free Alex Saab now. Free Alex Saab now. Free Alex Saab now. No to sanctions on Venezuela. No to sanctions on Venezuela. U.S. hands off Venezuela. U.S. hands off Venezuela. Libertad para Alex Saab. 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 Muchísimas gracias a todos y todas. Hasta el mes de agosto. Un abrazo fuerte. Estamos en la lucha para fin a sanciones a Venezuela desde Canadá y los Estados Unidos. We are here to demand an end to sanctions on Venezuela from the United States and Canada. We will be gathered again once again in August for our 18th monthly picket. Hasta la victoria siempre. Venceremos. Gracias. We will win. Muchas gracias. Good night. Good night. Good night. Muchas gracias, todos. Hasta agosto, until August. Thank you, everyone. Good night. There's a few more people joining. I hope that's a reunido en este momento, pues. Thank you again. Good night. It's two o'clock here in the UK. Ah, thank you for joining from the UK and for staying up tonight. It's great to have you here. Free Alex up. Free Alex up. And Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.